From Las Vegas, Nevada, the entertainment capital of the world, I'm David Gabbard, and this is the Vegas Faces Podcast, where we talk with Las Vegas locals about what it's really like to live in the city of lights. Whether you're living in Vegas, moving to Vegas, or just visiting Vegas and looking for new adventures, together let's discover the hidden gems that make Sin City the most visited place on earth. Everybody, welcome to Vegas Faces, where we talk to the people of Las Vegas. We find out what it's really like to live in the entertainment capital of the world. We have a fantastic guest today. Kevin McKinnon is in studio. He is a mortgage loan officer with Movement Mortgage here in Las Vegas. What's going on, Kevin? Thank you for being here. Welcome Absolutely. to Vegas Faces. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. I was excited when I saw that you're a mortgage loan officer. I'm a real estate agent. I'm going to come right into it with the rates. Like I know it. that that's like <laughs> people's number one concern. It's all over the headlines. Yep. It's a big, big deal. And yeah, this is a Vegas podcast. Let's talk about rates and then we'll talk about Vegas. Yeah, absolutely. So there's actually been a lot of, let's just call it, criticism lately of with the Joe Biden uh, changes to interest rates. And so I put out a post a couple of days ago and say, first of all, like presidents don't really have any influence over what happens with these things. So there was the FHFA, so the Federal Housing Finance Administration Agency. And so those are the people that changed all of the rules that ended up changing the, the cost of interest rates. And so what a lot of I do with my content is just to be educational. I try to make things that are sort of clickbait headlines and break them down so that whether it's you, the real estate agent or the client who's you know consuming the content understands that there's a little more depth behind you know just that kind of crazy clickbait headline and so at the end of the day you know every mortgage interest rate has always had a cost associated with it so the only thing that's changed recently is that people with lower credit scores have been given a little bit less of a penalty for having a lower credit score uh, people with a higher credit score have kind of been issued a smaller penalty so uh, at the end of the day, it's still better to have higher credit score and a higher down payment versus having a lower credit score and a lower down payment. And that's where a lot of the confusion was, was people thinking like, well, if I have a 640 credit score, I'm going to get a better rate than if I have a 780 credit score. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get out there to share with all my real estate agent partners and, and clients that follow me. You know, the reality is higher credit scores always going to have a better rate than lower credit scores. They're just limiting the penalty for lower credit score. The confusion that I've been hearing, too, is saying if you have a higher credit score, that means you're going to pay more. And so therefore, what's what's the point of even trying to look for a house at this time? But why did it get so convoluted like that? So the I guess the, the buzzwords that came out was the change in what the, the loan level pricing adjustments and, and the loan level pricing adjustment is what the cost of the rate. Is. So if you have a 740 credit score and you're putting down 5%, there is a specific cost for that little threshold that you're in. If you have 740 credit and you're putting down 20%, there's a lower cost to that. If you have 740 credit and you're putting down 30%, there's a lower cost to that rate. And so what got messed up is that there was sort of, let's call it a heat map that chain that showed where the adjustments and all of these prices were. And so it got very incredibly misunderstood that a lot of people saw people with lower credit scores, there was in a, a positive adjustment, essentially meaning that they were going to have less of a, a cost involved with their, uh, their interest rate than they previously had, but it still wasn't better than somebody with a higher credit score. And so what it really came down to, in my opinion, was just inaccurate reporting, you know, just kind of picking out and cherry picking headlines that said, hey, if you have good credit and you're now being penalized for it and, you know, poor people with crappier credit mm -hmm. are being aided by the Biden administration. And so, you know, I try not to ever get political on things, but I just want there to be like clear understanding of, you know, who made this directive, not the president, what the actual changes were, higher credit scores still get better rates than lower credit scores and stuff like that. And so I probably had before I put that post out 30, 40 agents reach out to me, DMs, phone calls, text messages, trying to figure out how to explain it to their clients, just trying to understand it for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I always appreciate the people that reach out and try to understand it versus the people that just kind of regurgitate those those headlines. Sure. And, you know, that like you were saying, clickbait, like it, it's a better headline when it reads high credit score equals high mortgage rate. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. It gets people stirred up. It gets, you yep. know... It, at the end of the day, it sells advertising, sells newspapers, you know, without a doubt, sells clicks, all that stuff. So, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of it are, 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 are simple. You know, like I said, higher credit score, higher down payment, always going to get a better rate than lower credit score, lower down payment. That lower tier is just mm -hmm. getting penalized less than they used to. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, thank you for clarifying, Kevin. Absolutely. My pleasure. How did you get into mortgages in the first place? And where <laughs> were you before that? 
So the the mortgage world came about, I think a lot of people changed professions during the pandemic time. Um, I'd spent 20 something years in hospitality. Uh, it's my first job ever as a busboy and a dishwasher. Got all the way up to GM of several places in New York City and Boston and uh, here in Las Vegas. COVID hit. I was running a show uh, on the Las Vegas Strip, Atomic Saloon show, doing the food and beverage gig there. And just realized that I knew that my job was so dependent on the governor, the owner of my show, the casino. Uh, I knew that the show was going to come back, but I just didn't know when or where. And I didn't know if we were going to be shut down three months later. And so I just felt this overwhelming sense of insecurity with the position I've had my entire life. Um, And so I kind of recalled on some experience I had as a real estate agent way back in Boston in New York City, where I spent most of my life on the East Coast. Uh, I was an agent for about five years. And so revisited some friends here that were real estate agents, kind of picked their brains of, you know, was it better to, you know, start over boots on the ground real estate agent? I'm really analytically in systems built in my mind. So maybe lending is is a, a good opportunity for me to explore. Um, and a friend of mine was friends with my boss's wife. It was kind of right time, right place. Got in there, shadowed him for a little while. He had a hospitality background. We, we shared a lot of similar uh, ideas on just how to, you know, approach the business. And so just got lucky with the the first uh, shop that I started with, and it's been three years since then. It's amazing. And that's what I love about Vegas, too. A, it's the place where it's, it's not necessarily only about who you know, but it definitely helps. For sure. And then, like you said, these people had background in hospitality. They came from somewhere else, and then they ended up in mortgages. Mary, my wife, she worked uh, for a real estate firm where everyone came from Cirque du Soleil. Okay. You know, and they were just like, hey, we're, you know, we're hitting our 30s. You know, it's it's doing damage to our body. We can't be doing this for the rest of our lives. Yeah. We're transitioning into real estate. So I don't, I've never seen that at least. When we lived in Chicago, I never met people like that that came from a, a background that's, that's a complete opposite industry. And then here we are now working in finance or something like that. Yeah. So it's it's fun. It adds a little extra element here in Vegas that, that I've, I haven't seen in other cities. I think it's just, it's a cool thing about this city in the sense that, you know, you can have such a wildly different background. And I think a lot of it is the industry. I mean, real estate and mortgage, you're not really going to college or getting a higher education in those things. It's a lot of just sort of self-taught stuff and, you know, having a mentor. But you can really pivot from, I don't know, damn near any other career you've ever had. Um, and if you've got like the the sauce for it and the gumption and the the perseverance, and it's one of those things that you can just kind of hit the hit the ground running. Whereas I don't think there's many other opportunities industry wise, and either in other cities because they just kind of seem a little more set in their ways that you just don't have those opportunities the way you do here. How did Vegas come about? So Vegas came about through a previous relationship of mine. I was working for the Tao Group in New York City at that time, and I loved it, but it was grinding me into dust. Like 60, 70 hours a week, seven days a week, just no days off. I actually got hit by a truck on my one day off of work and they were just like, are you still coming in? (laughs) Wow. Like you, like as a pedestrian or you were in a, I was riding my bicycle and I, it, it, everything happened in slow motion. I remember being on the outside of this, uh, like, you know, truck outside of a bodega, just like delivering stuff. And in my head, I was like, this guy might open his door and he's going to clip me. So he opens his door, clip my handlebar. I went over the handlebars. Luckily I bounced off of a truck that was next to me, like in traffic. And I just kind of tumbled, uh, away from traffic. I remember immediately being the most upset because a pair of my sunglasses got run over and I was like, oh, those are my favorite shades. <laughs> wow. So like the shock hadn't quite set in. But, you know, fast forward, I mean, that was just like the life. I mean, everything was 70 hours a week overexerting myself. And so the You're on your feet all the time. Oh, all day, every day. Yeah. I mean, 12, 14 hours a day working from noon until three, four yeah, in the morning. Say, tough hours. Yeah. yeah. So there was there was just no off switch. And so when I had the opportunity to move out here with the the girl I was dating, I just took it immediately. I was like, great, this is a perfect excuse to get out of New York City. Working in hospitality in Las Vegas was so much slower than New York City, which a lot of people couldn't imagine. But I was like, I wasn't working 70 hours a week in Las Vegas. It was just a more, you still have the crazy hours-ish, but it just wasn't the same level of intensity. Um, you don't have that hustle bustle vibe that you do with the big city for sure. It was like, I mean, I worked, my first job was at a a manager at Rose rabbit lie at the Cosmo. And so we were only open four days a week, which to me was like the biggest blessing ever. I was like, (laughs) we're only four nights. Like this is the easiest job I've ever had. And so it was just, it's a different pace. And so working in a casino, you know, you kind of knew like your exact sweet spot hours for when things were going to be busy on specific days. And in New York, I mean, any day, any time, any part of the week could be crazy. You might have enormous buyouts. Like it was just more unpredictable. 
So when I came to Vegas, things were a little more predictable and easier to schedule. And so, you know, kind of cut my teeth there. Like I said, went through a couple of years, COVID happened and made that transition. But people always thought I was crazy when I said I moved to Las Vegas and things slowed down for me in the hospitality industry. <laughs> I wonder if that's weather attributed. There's something about that East Coast cold that everyone's stacked on top of everyone, you know, that the, just the loud sirens at any hour of the day or night. You're just more irritated and, and easily frustrated all the time. I think irritated is a good word. When I moved out here, my staff was like, do you think I'd make it? Categorically, no, <laughs> none of you. Maybe this guy, maybe this girl. We're soft out here. We are soft. And it's the way I describe it is there's no days off in New York City. Everybody all the time, everyone around you is going at a thousand miles an hour. And so you can't slow down because you are walking amongst them. You're on the subway, you're mm -hmm. running your errands. Like, but there's just no, there's no like gear to shift down and just be like, oh, I'm just going to chill today. Like I love playing golf and it would take me like an entire day to leave the city, rent a car, get on a subway, take a train. Like everything's an ordeal in and outside of New York City. And so to that point, like, you just don't get a day off. Mm -hmm. so, On top of layering and wearing, you know, Yeah, having been the winter, sweaters. I mean, yeah, it goes from <laughs> rain to freezing rain to snow to 70 degrees to 20 degrees. Like, I mean, you're bringing two changes of mm -hmm. clothes with you to work because everything from your knees down is brown and gray, covered mm -hmm. in slush and sand and mud. <laughs> so like, It's that, an exhausting lifestyle. I was going to say, it just wears on you. Like, after a couple of years, you're just like, what? am I doing mm -hmm. yeah. still living here? Yeah. Did you find Vegas versus New York, the city that never sleeps? I feel like both cities get that nickname. Yep. Having lived in both cities, I just picture Vegas as the city that never sleeps because literally everything, not everything, but a lot of things here are just 24 seven. Whereas in New York, isn't there like last call still in the, in the hospitality industry in the bar scene? There is. New York City is very much more underground, the city that never sleeps. Like we don't have PTs that are open 24 seven. Okay. But when you know where to go, got it. things close at 6, 7 a.m. if they close at all. So it's very much a – if you're in the know, you can find trouble seven days a week, any part <laughs> of the city. In Vegas, it's like, oh, it's just a, you know, at a gaming bar you know, on a Wednesday at PT's and you know, Silverado Ranch. Got it. So it's, it's a little more pedestrian. The Vegas you know, never city that – or excuse me, the, the New York City that never sleeps is like a little more in the know. So I don't know if it feels like a little more dangerous or like you feel more – you know, like, you know, what's going on versus, you know, the, the average person. I but, see. Okay. It makes it maybe a little bit more fun because it's, you know, not, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. Not everybody's got, got the connect, especially in hospitality. It's like, you know, that next level of people who are like, oh yeah, last calls at four. And then they close the bar at like eight in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you're like cool that was a tuesday <laughs> wow. it's kind of like the cannabis industry here like it's it's almost boring because it's just like it's it's illegal like anyone can go to it it's, right they're like where's that sense of danger where's that uh oh i'm doing something wrong feeling yeah. like i need to have a connect and you're like nope you can just walk in off the street yeah like it literally like they look like baskin robbins like it, it's like they <laughs> yeah. just like flavors of you yeah know, like what about you said uh you were a real estate agent also in new york so i'm curious what that was like real estate in New York and the East Coast versus real estate here in Vegas. Yeah. So uh, I started in 2007 as a real estate agent in Boston, which was phenomenal timing considering we were peaking at our global implosion. And so I decided uh, after, you know, going to college and working in hospitality, I was like, oh, I'll just kind of, you know, stretch my wings and try something else. And so still bartender on the side, got my real estate license, ended up working with a broker I'm still very good friends with to this day who kind of showed me the ropes and and it was we were you know Boston was a bubble that was very different than the rest of the country where you had places like Phoenix and Vegas and places in Florida that had you know crazy foreclosure rates like Boston the, like the needle moved like a little bit up and down in each direction so it was nothing crazy certainly more stable um, I did a ton of rentals at that time when I started and there's, you know, 700 colleges in Boston. So there's a insanely busy rental market for students every year, plus young professionals. And so it was a pretty stable market. I kind of started a trend moving from Boston to New York. I moved to New York with a, a different ex-girlfriend and, you know, dove right into real estate there. And it was lucrative and it was fast paced and it was fun. Like all the things I liked about real estate but I found myself really compromising my morals and, and kind of telling half truths to get deals done. And, you know, people in my own office just backstabbing everybody. Like it just was uncomfortable for me. Um, so after about a year, I just realized I didn't want that to be what I did for a living. I didn't want to feel uncomfortable with how I was making money. And so literally just dove right back into the hospitality industry. 
um, started managing restaurants again and kind of found my way back through, you know, New York for the next six years that way. Did mortgages ever appeal to you at that time? No, I, I mean, I joke around with people, family and friends that have known me for a while. And I was like, if I had to talk to Kevin from 10 years ago, they would have thought I was fucking crazy <laughs> that I lived banker hours and worked, you know, eight to five ish, eight to six ish. Um, I used to have a joke in my family of like the noon rule. I was like, don't bother calling me before noon. Like I'll never pick up your phone call. I'll be asleep. Yeah, yeah. And so I went from that to like waking up, you know, I go to like spin class at 6am three days a week now. <laughs> and I just, you know, a younger version of me would have thought I was kidding if I had to explain what I'm doing now at this point in my life, but never occurred to me. It was just one of those, you know, parts of the business that I, you know, was a necessary evil to kind of understand, but just never had an interest at that point. Yeah. Was it a shock to you when you came to Vegas from New York City, from the East Coast, weather wise, uh, scenery wise, people, everything? It was a shock in a positive way. I was I was one of those people who didn't know a goddamn thing about Las Vegas. Like I'd been once as an adult the year before. And the last time I'd been there was about 12 years before for a friend's wedding when I was 20 and was like gambling with a fake ID. And so I didn't know anything about Las Vegas outside of the strip. I remember I stayed at the Sahara uh, in the Strat. And those were like the two places I'd ever stayed at. So, I mean, I didn't even know the, the fun part of the strip. <laughs> so <laughs> when I came here, I, the, like the beginning or the end, yeah, depending was, on yeah. how you look at it. Yeah. So when I moved here, I was just like, oh man, I, I love to play golf. And I realized there was a golf course every 20 feet. Uh, love to hike and be outdoors. And I didn't realize how close Lake Mead and Colorado river were and Mount Charleston. And so the, the surprise was genuinely positive. I was just like, holy crap. I didn't realize there's so much going on within 20 or 30 minutes. Cause like I said before, to leave New York city is an entire <laughs> Everything's so day close endeavor, yeah. like renting a car, a getting hassle. on a, you know, the Metro train, like all of it's a hassle. And here's just like walking to the train, waiting on the train. Yeah. Oh, you, you just got to the train station and train just left. So rain delays coming back from, you know, Long Island on the weekend. It's full. So you just mm -hmm. got to wait for the next one. So like getting those... delayed while on the train. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. God knows what's <laughs> happening in front just of you. Underground sitting there. Yeah. So it was, it was all pleasant surprises coming in, realizing there was so much at, uh, you know, at your fingertips. And that's one of the things I've, I've mentioned to friends and family and just anyone that'll listen, like, listen, there's so much more here than you could possibly imagine. And again, coming from cities, Boston and New York that were so established, there was no new construction. There was, you know, an occasional high rise that went up somewhere. So you didn't really get to experience growth and being here for, it's been seven years this past January. I mean, the entire landscape has changed probably two or three times over from when I got here. So it's, it's been cool to see it's a major city come up into its next level and, and, you know, it's, 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 you know, growth into where it was a couple of years ago to where it is now. And obviously with getting all these major sports teams and major development, like where we're going to be in the next four or five years. Yeah. It's going to be insane. I hope the traffic doesn't get worse though. Yeah. I mean, hard to say that it won't, but I still think we're spoiled. I mean, I'll say it. Vegas sure. doesn't have bad traffic yet. It like, doesn't. It has bad traffic for people who've lived here for a while. It doesn't have bad traffic. Right. Yet. Compared to New York City, Chicago. Yep. I, yeah. I grew up in Houston. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, we're not LA. Yeah. yeah. We're not, we're not there. And I don't think it'll ever get there. I really don't. Yeah. So, I, I'd like yeah, to think crossed. that we'll be able to <laughs> look at it long enough uh, in advance to, yeah. to not get there. But yeah, I still always, I give people crap here. I'm like, mm -hmm. it's, it's not bad. Tra 30 minutes isn't traffic. Like it's yeah. just... Uh, I used to take a subway. My last job in New York City was an hour and 10 minute subway with two transfers. Yeah. I was like, yeah. that was just the life, man. Just the like, norm. That was it. So 30 minutes in traffic isn't, mm -hmm. isn't the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Did your friends, family, did they make fun of you moving to Vegas? And I asked because for us, it was like, so what, you live on the strip? Like, that's like such a like yep. cliche question that we get. And we're, I'm like, are you serious? It's almost equivalent to when I would tell people I'm from Texas and I'm not in Texas. They're like, are you ride horses? And I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> haha, funny. I get but they're it. like, no, but really, do you live on the strip? I'm like, what? So I don't know. Did you experience any of that? Same questions. Um, I told everybody I want to leave winter. I don't want to live in winter anymore. So I'll take you know, three months of heat, but kind of the same thing. I mean, it, they were just as unaware as I was of what was going on and what was available here. So I would say more family, uh, or excuse me, more friends and family thought I was just living in a hotel on the strip for a while. <laughs> family, obviously a little more uh, invested in, in what I was actually up to, but 
still cousins and aunts and uncles like uh what's uh what's it like what do you what are you doing out there yeah, like, or like why? hey do you have a gambling problem like yeah are you something you're not telling us like as if like you moved there because of some secret yeah. vice that you're not telling people yeah i did play blackjack exclusively for like a year and a half for work so that was kind of fun but like card counting yeah really yeah i actually got banned from uh south point casino wow it was like an oddly proud this moment in my life yeah i mean this is great that <laughs> yeah <laughs> well just like we were saying like everyone's got some kind of fun crazy backstory yeah that i you know that's why i love living here but yeah go into that the only thing i know about card counting is like you know the that movie 21 or you yeah. know they they studied a system they they worked with a team they kind of it's you know memorized the count and all that type of stuff there's i mean i did it at it's like most remedial level but it's it's the easiest system there's i mean there's like 11 or 12 or 13 different card counting systems and i started with basic one it's plus one minus one like reading a book like how did you even get into that just googling there's a so there's your basic <laughs> basic strategy chart which says if you ever have these cards versus the dealer cards everything's color coded here's what you do here's what you do like always follow the book and you'll have the slightest statistical advantage if you're counting cards wow. um because so you think, really are a numbers guy yeah it's amazing yeah so Wow. You get to the point like two, three, four, five, six or plus one, seven, eight, nine are worth nothing, 10, jack, queen, king, ace or minus one. So every time a face card comes out, the count gets lower. So that's a bad thing because that means all the valuable cards have been put out. So the more of the positive cards, two, three, four, five, six that have gone out means there's more valuable cards left in the shoe. And so I there's like two apps I downloaded on my phone that you just practice counting cards on. And they'll like fire off different scenarios and you've got to tell them what the count is. And so you can do this by yourself because I'm, I'm referencing a movie, a Hollywood. Yeah, there's definitely movie, bigger teams. But in, why the team and why not? And why not the team? Uh, the team's just harder. So they're, they were doing it with eight deck shoes at like major casinos. I would find places that dig, uh, they called two deck pitch. So it was just two decks and they dealt cards overhand. So it was just, you, you saw more of the information. I mean, I could probably teach myself to get all the way up to eight decks of cards, but I was like, well, I go there if you can learn too. And so I just started bouncing around different ca local casinos and I live right down the street from South Point and admittedly just got a little lackadaisical. I was there a little too many times and, you know, it wasn't like I was clearing 50 grand. Like, like you, were, I was, you were winning too, too much more than losing. Like you didn't make it yeah. obvious. Maybe. And I was just there. I would go like three days a week instead of like a day a week and then go to like a Silverton or Green Valley mm -hmm. Ranch or just, you know, any of the other local casinos. I was just like, ah, fuck it. It's down the street. I'll just go again. <laughs> like I knew most of the dealers. Like it was just a friendly environment. And so I remember the, the just like Kevin hasn't lost in like three months. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah. You lose, but it was just like incrementally, like you would still just be positive. And so I even remember the night that, uh, it happened. There was a pit boss. There was a woman and she never talked to me like other people. You just get to be, you know, kind of local and you chat with them. And this lady never spoke to me. And I think looking back on it, she probably knew I was a little up to something. And so the the count they call it was like when in my favor being you know having more smaller cards out and i was just like all right so i adjusted my bets from you know one to another and that and went is on that, for is that always a red flag or not always red flag, but is it like oh he's betting you know 20 bucks here 20 bucks there oh hey now he's betting 200 it's a yeah it's and enough he, and he's only winning when he raises yeah. his bet like that yeah in hindsight i could have so it's probably, things there's a little better to that too just the, yeah. the hidden whatever that is so there's sort of like you'll you should start with you know whether you're betting 20 or 25 or 50 and your max should be a specific amount and so at that point i think i was like 100 200 so it wasn't crazy but she could just tell based on that betting and like where the cards were like it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out yeah. at, at that point and so she comes up to me and she pushes my chips back in front of me and she goes sir your place too good for us and i was like in my head, she could be like, play dumb. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? She's like, your play's too good for us. Like, you have to cash out. And I was like, uh. Was she signaled by someone in, you know, the cameras in the she sky? She was like, she might have been, but I could see her out of my, like, corner of my left eye. And after, like, a few hands where I was increasing my bet, she just beelined it over to me. Like, in the middle of cards being dealt, she was like. So, what, you try to cash out your chips and that's when they said, get well, out of here? She told me to get out of there. Like, they they were cool. They were just like, go ahead. You can play any other table game that you want here. You just can no longer play blackjack. 
And wow. I was like, okay, cool. Like so, for the rest of the night? And she's like, no, indefinitely. And I was like, oh. Like, okay. does your name go on a list? Probably. I mean, there was a player's cards. Like everybody knew you know, like who the regulars were there. Wow. Uh, certainly not something I'll ever test because I don't really yeah. want to find out what happens. <laughs> but you were still able to cash out your chips and all yeah, that? Yeah, I cashed out my chips. Went and played roulette for a little while just to kind of fake like I wasn't phased by it. But I got home and I was like, holy shit. I can't believe that just happened. And luck, I mean, you know, again, referencing mm-hmm. Hollywood exaggerated mafia movies, but like the movie Casino, they take you out in the back. They yeah. smash your hand with a hammer. In South that's, Point. That scene in Casino, like that's what I'm picturing. And then yeah it's like oh wow you kind of got off easy for sure for sure uh owner of south point casino is also known for still being pretty old school so you know it's not like one of these massive chains like mgm um one of my good friends is banned from all mgm casinos worldwide for counting cards but he was at like a winning 50 60 grand a clip i was like trying to clear 1500 or 2500 bucks but he can know like if he goes and plays blackjack like there are massive consequences for me i don't want to test those those waters so i'll just yep great Got like, it. So be, being banned at South Point is it's only South Point. Yeah, it's only South Point. They and don't, honestly, they don't notify the other casinos about you or anything crazy like that. They don't. I I can't imagine they would. If it was a bigger casino brand, I would imagine they might share that information. Like someone's like clipping us off for a hundred k every time. So keep an eye out. Um, but they're you know known as being independently owned and sort of the yeah. one stop shop. I just don't get why it's illegal because it's not like you're. It wearing isn't. a device or, you know, something that where like, it's not like you have like a mirror up your sleeve right. and you can see what the dealer has. Like you're not like outwardly cheating. It's like this guy read some strategy. books, like he, uh, he learned something to where yeah. he can now beat the casino. Like what's the problem? So it's technically not illegal. It's just frowned upon and they get to make their own rules. And so it's frowned upon because they can't, you know, pay for the fancy fountains and exactly. And so it goes from like a statistical advantage for them of like half a percent to you getting a advantage of like half to one percent and so even at that rate i mean there's still so much chance that goes into it i mean if the guy behind you is playing like a jackass and not following strategy or Mm -hmm. you just get bad cards like you know that's just it's a numbers game and so the whole point is you have to play a specific strategy over a long period of time and by doing so adding in the slight benefit of card counting will increase what your take home is yeah. And so obviously they don't want anyone to have a benefit. And so when they catch you, then it's be like, well, no longer get the opportunity to use that benefit. It's so wild. It's like, you can play as long as you lose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you win by dumb luck, yeah. cool. But we can tell, you know, through some history here that, you know, you're, you've mm-hmm. got a, a specific strategy you've got in play. And even like the level that you were saying that you were playing, it's not like you were playing for like tens of millions of dollars to where you're like really going to like affect the business of this casino. Like yeah. there's still plenty of losers out there like all around me. losing <laughs> yeah. in the casino that, you know, it makes up for like your small winning. So yeah, it's like it was, it was cool for me. I got to, to not work for about a year or so just playing blackjack and living. I was told everybody I was retired. I was like, yeah, wow. I'm already retired. <laughs> <laughs> do you still try it at like other casinos off the strip or in other towns and things like that? I do. Yeah. Um, and again, just cause I'm so analytically driven, like I'll sit down at a table and I just can't not, it's just, it's yeah. a skill that you have. It's like, you know, going to a pickup basketball game and not dribbling a basketball, like you would just dribble a basketball and kill some time. Like, yeah. you know, if you played soccer growing up and you're there, you know, at a soccer game, like you'd kick the ball around. Yeah. Um, that's the way I describe it. I'm just, it's a, it's almost like a habit or like a, a, a reflex at this point. I think the best part of everything that came from it was me being able to tell family and friends the whole story of being banned from a casino <laughs> in Las Vegas and just seeing the like wide eye, oh my God. I was like, that was worth it enough. There's plenty of other casinos I can play blackjack at. So it's not like the door got slammed on me forever. Yeah, it's amazing. I played poker in my 20s because I did not want to get a real job. I was very rebellious in my early 20s. And uh, my favorite poker player, Stu Unger, he was a famous blackjack card counter and banned from everywhere. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, you know, again, but, you know, he had like this like savant. He, he would He would just make bets with the dealers and just say like, I'll tell you what the next card is going to be type of stuff. For me, I was always into like the like the mental chess, mental jujitsu mm-hmm. of poker type of thing. Whereas with blackjack, I found it like just too arbitrary. It was just like too, just memorize this, memorize that, and yeah. then you're good. And it, with poker, there's like a lot of nuance, there's yeah. psychology, there's emotion. Yeah, individuals In addition to strategy. Other. Whereas yeah. like with blackjack, it's like, nope, what are they showing? What are you showing? Okay, here, here are the odds, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Plug I'm and play. Dead on. Yeah, there, there was no nuance to like challenging your opponent. Like the opponent was just the cards. Yeah. Yeah. So I can see what, you know, poker, obviously finding that skill of, you know, understanding probabilities and the analytical side, but also like beating your opponent. 
So, okay, you, you went from your blackjack hiatus, yep. and is that when things kind of shifted toward, like, was it getting towards mortgage? Like, was mortgages at, if, like, that was in the back of way, your mind? Yeah, okay. Way in the future. So wow. I went from that to a friend of mine who I'd worked with at Cosmopolitan was like, hey, uh, Spiegel World, the, the company that owns Atomic Saloon Show and uh, Absinthe and, uh, what is it, Del- or Super Frisco at Cosmo. They were like, we're going to open up a new uh, show, and I put your name in the running to be the GM of food and beverage. And I was like, dope. Because as cool as it is to like play blackjack and just kind of be retired, it's certainly not a, a <laughs> steady stream of income, and there's it's a lot of chance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so I just hadn't taken it to that level of seriousness. And so I was like, cool. End up getting that job and, and uh, kind of dove in feet first in like mid-2019. It had been the first time I'd, I'd launched a – let's call it a venue in about four or five years because I'd, I'd done a lot of that in Boston, New York City. So it was cool to be like boots on the ground, like picking every single design and kind of having your your hands on everything. So it opened in September of 2019 and just, you know, COVID hit. I remember our last day that I worked there was St. Patrick's Day 2020. I did a little consulting for them afterwards, but just realized, you know, I was trying to find something that might not be at the you know mercy of governors and casino owners and show owners and so sure um believe me i I wish i could have stayed there you know still have some good friends there loved the product we put out loved everything we did it just got to that point of just being in my late 30s and wanting to find something a little more stable that i was in control over versus Mm -hmm. having someone else be the the one that dictated how that business operated Sure. I mean, just one bad rug pull and you're like, okay, let's yeah. reevaluate. Yeah. Like CDC says something bad again. Pfft, call, yeah. You know, yeah. casinos closed. Great. Okay. We're out of business for a week, a month, a year. So mm-hmm. that was kind of the, the unsettling part that I didn't, you know, I didn't want to leave, but that was really kind of what dictated me switching into the mortgage side of things of, you know, people are always going to buy houses. And I kind of, yeah. I knew that from real estate getting into it when there was a global recession, people are going to buy houses. Everybody needs a place to live. You know, whether you're moving for a good reason or a bad reason, like those transactions will always happen. And that's kind of what spurred me to explore that side of, you know, a new career because I was a little more in in charge of it, you know, being an outward salesperson. You know, my output is dictated by how much effort I put into things and it's not really dictated by a boss or a so-and-so. When you said that the sliminess in New York with the real estate and all that, can you go into that a little bit and then also compare, do you see that here and yes or no? And if not in, in New York, obviously a ton of doorman buildings. And so for the majority of them, if there was a a listing open in a doorman building, they just, they wouldn't have a key. You would just sign in with your ID, bring your clients up, doors unlocked. What would happen when an agent before you was showing that all too frequently was they would lock the door. And then you would go downstairs and so they would take their clients and they kind of gave them a head start. And so you'd get there with some door guy who doesn't give two shits about his job. And so he's like, yeah, go up to 425. So you get up to 425, doors locked. So you kind of look like an idiot in front of your clients. Okay, we'll go back down. You go back down. Sometimes the doorman doesn't really care or maybe he can't find the key or whatever. And so you realize that somebody just locked the door on you to screw you out from even having an opportunity to take a look at that unit. And that happened daily. There were management offices all over the city that you would have to go get keys from for specific units. And the whole rule was you got to be back in an hour or two hours. But people would just keep keys for like a day or a weekend. So they'd pick up four or five keys on a Friday, knowing that these were, you know, high interest units and just keep the keys for the entire weekend. And so those weren't even your competitors. Those were people in your own office. And so you ended up having to kind of follow in that same suit of like, well, I've got to make sure I can secure this deal for my clients. So I'm going to do some shady shit and make sure nobody else can get into the unit. And so it just felt slimy to me. Like, yeah, the money was there. Everything's expensive in New York City. Commissions are high, but I just didn't feel good at the end of the day with the way I was serving my clients. And then at the same time, I mean, the commissions were crazy. Most cities, or let's, let's call it most cities on the East Coast were commissions one month rent. New York City could be up to a month and a half. And so by the time you're putting down, you know, for a $2,000 apartment, first class security and fee, you're close to 10 grand. And to be finding places for people that they didn't love, but it was almost an obligation because there's 12,000 people looking for the same 500 apartments. Like, I just didn't feel like I was doing a good job of providing a great service and a great product to people. 
And so after enough of those deals, I was just like, I'm done. Like, I know I can go back to hospitality, jump right in with my eyes closed and pick up where I left off in Boston and just feel way better about what I do and how I service my clients and customers and, you know, even treat staff. Like, I just felt better about it. So, yeah, I don't see that here. Luckily, it's a different market. Obviously, technology has advanced. Those little automated, you know, door computer code things where you get Mm -hmm. to pop the keys open had not been invented. Had they, it might have been a a smoother business uh, in New York City. But out here, there's still rabid competition. I mean, we've got two months of inventory on the market. We're still seeing multiple offer situations again, kind of poking their head out of of the market in the last few weeks from what I've seen with my clients. So I still see rabid competition, but just it happening on a better moral level. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Was there shadiness like from agent to client, like not telling them about certain things about the property? And that happens like that? a lot. Oh, yeah. No. Oh no. And so, yeah, I mean, just not explaining the rules of the building or, you know, just, oh. yeah, it, it was, it was more withholding information uh, for a lot of people than, than anything. And again, that to me, was just, you know, you're telling half truths, like you're not being completely yeah. open and transparent about something. Um, I think so, you're just giving all agents a bad rap, like doesn't not necessarily just for New York, but like, Oh, you're, you're a realtor. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, slimy. Yeah. 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 Oh, you, it sucks. only takes one story to hear about your cousin who lives in New York city to be like, ugh, everyone's a scumbag. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. So one of the things that I've always prided myself on in the mortgage side, since I've started is be, being transparent. Like I, I have bought and sold properties in in Boston and here, and I never paid attention, honestly, as dumb as it sounds, to a lot of the paperwork. I was just like, whoever I'm working with, I trust. So, you, know, <laughs> like, you know, I don't have to ask too many questions. And you know, I was younger, and so I just kind of signed everything, and I did a bunch of transactions with Wells Fargo. So I can only imagine in hindsight how much money they probably charge me. <laughs> so I try to make it a point to be overly transparent. I want my clients to know what all of my costs and fees are. I want them to see what I see when we lock interest rates. I want them to know upfront what all of the costs are, what the potential, you know, other cost. you know, I just want them to see the whole picture the way I see it because I want people to make an informed decision. And I've, I've luckily never had this problem myself, but I've just heard horror stories of people at the closing table being like, what the fuck? Like, where did all this money come from? Like, how, mm-hmm. how am I supposed to afford this now? Like, this isn't what we talked about. Oh, man. And I just never want anyone I work with to be put in that position where they were like, Kevin didn't give me the full picture. Yeah. Just from like a, a personal moral standpoint, pride standpoint, like I just want to be a better loan officer than anyone that's ever done that to a client. Probably comes, comes from your hospitality background too. Like you, you want these people to feel good at the end of the day. Like you, you want them to feel like they got the best of it. I think that that's incredibly true in, in having dealt with, you know, a bazillion real estate agents at this point over three years. One of the things that I'll get feedback on is, you know, like, wow, you're incredibly easy to get a hold of. And like, you're very, you know, easy to communicate with. And, you know, whenever we have questions, you're, you know, open to having a discussion, even if it's silly question, things like that. But I genuinely think that comes from my hospitality background, because I always treated your visit to my venue is the most important thing, whether it was a birthday party, happy hour, bachelor party, divorce party, you just going out to dinner with a buddy. Like it's important. Like you guys chose to come to my venue. And so I want to treat you with enough respect to be like, you guys deserve to have everything go perfectly. Mm-hmm. Doesn't always happen that way, but you know, I take that same approach with my mortgage clients of like, you guys are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're putting down crazy hard earned savings the least I can do is make myself available to answer the silliest of questions a thousand times in a row. It, jump on a Zoom, great. Text me, great. DM me on Instagram, great. Call me, great. Like, if I can't be available in the moment, I promise I'll make myself available. And that level of hospitality, obviously, you know, kind of spreads with the people you work with and the agents you work with. And, you know, I think people want to surround themselves with people that want to conduct business this way. And so it's kind of helped me grow my business pretty quickly in the the three short years I've been doing this. Sure. And it's a reputation business at the end of the day. I mean, it's all, you know, I also come from the comedy world of Chicago and they would always say like, you don't want to just get booked, but you also like you, most importantly, you want to get booked back. Like you, right. you want that repeat business. And same for here. It's like, just go the extra mile. It's not that much extra effort. Right. Do it the right way and you'll get the referrals. Yeah. For being an agent, the second you tell someone you're a real estate agent, they're like, oh, how's the market? Yep. Do you get that with mortgages? You what? What? What is your go-to question anytime you tell people that you're a loan officer? I just, uh, I guess 
am making this pivot. I'm about to make this pivot in the middle of it. Um, one of the guys that's in my company is a, a huge, huge, huge producer. Um, his name is Keith Collins, and he explains to people that he's a real estate professional. He's not a loan officer. Because at the end of the day, he's a real estate professional. Like He knows about the markets. He knows about how to construct offers. He knows everything intimately involved in the real estate transaction. And so he realized years ago not to pigeonhole himself into just being a loan officer because if that's all you do, people will kind of make a note of you're just the money guy. And so he's positioned himself as I'm a real estate professional. And so I can answer. And if I can't answer, I can direct you to the people who can. So I've kind of taken on that. And this is super recently, probably in the last like six weeks um, of taking on that approach of I'm a real estate professional. Like I obviously have the real estate agent background to pull from. Um, so I understand some of the trials and tribulations and frustrations you guys go through. And I've got my own experience on the lending side of what that looks like for me. But I would say overwhelmingly, first question, what are the rates? You know, how's <laughs> it's always a question. About what the do, rates. What yep. do you see happening in the future? <laughs> you know, what's uh, yeah, what's the market like? What is it going to what's what yeah. is it going to look like? Yeah. Then, yeah. Are rates going up? Rates going down? Should, should I buy a house uh, now, Kevin? Or should I wait? What's yeah. Gonna happen? What's going to happen to the prices? All of those questions. And, you know, for me, again, being systems, analytical, logistically driven, I follow a couple different resources, MBS Highway, Mortgage Coach. There's a couple of things, you know, there's a bunch of tools out there for us to look at concrete data. And so I'll explain to people that want the full long in-depth answer to things of like where inflation news is going and job uh, jobless reports and like what really moves the needle for the bond market and you know kind of explaining when the fed raises their interest rates what that actually means to mortgages and stuff like that so i've certainly learned to tailor my answers to like the 30 second here's this or like the five minutes you want like all the meat and potatoes kind of thing but do you it, focus heavily on the macro or are you uh, also focused on what's happening in the market exclusively for Vegas? Um, I do focus on Vegas. I think not so much all of the the financial data or the, or the analytical data, but more so that when you look at news and headlines, they're national. So you can't apply that to the market that we're in. So, you know, kind of going back into the Nevada was the number one state that absorbed businesses relocating from California last year. Like we have had some of the craziest business and population growth of any state in the country in the last five years. So like if we're looking at specific things to our market, you know, we just got the A's. We've got, you know, three major sports teams. There's probably a damn good chance we're getting an NBA team in the next three or four years. Like if you look at what's actually drawing people here, it's not slowing down. Hmm. And and I was I hate to use this term, but it just it's something I've kind of you know, had as a knee jerk reaction, like Vegas is almost too big to fail. Like we, we generate so much money for the economy on a, a national level. And we support so many other enormous global businesses. Formula One's coming for the next 10 years, right? Yeah. Formula ten, yeah. 10 year contract. So Super Bowl's coming. Like Super Bowl, there's a reason Pro why Bowl. They're picking yeah. Vegas. Like there's, there's just so much we have going for. So to your, your kind of question before, like, Oh, should I buy a house now? Absolutely. hundred <laughs> percent. Should have bought it yesterday. You know, the rate's the rate. We can always take advantage of when that that market corrects for us. But what you can't do is catch up on equity. Like you, you yeah. can't just get equity in two years by buying the house in two years. Like it, you earn it when you buy it now. Yep. And so I try to make that point to people of just, you know, I feel like I'm the least salesiest loan officer because I don't want to be the schmoozy person. Sure. I'm just the like, here's the data. And if you want to do with this data, whatever you want, great. Like I'll lean on you a little bit for what I think is the right decision. Yeah. But again, at the end of the day, I just want you to understand it and you can make your own decision from there. But what about the water, Kevin? Do people ask you about the water? All the time. I have one of my best <laughs> no, like friends. Me, like me. Look at the, look at the picture. Yeah. Look at how the colors. One of my best friends was like, I'm not buying a house here. And he's been telling me that for three years. And I was like, yeah. bro, you'd have so much equity right now. They like even out if, the colors of the Lake Mead. And they're like, oh, look at, look at the, you know. We like we get we get the bottom of Lake Mead. That's what a lot of people don't understand. Like when it gets to Deadpool and the water can't mm -hmm. go into any of the other drains for other states, like we get the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Mostly get recycled water. That's a huge thing that we do. We're here. the most, I think we're one of the, like, if not the most, like top three, most efficient states with mm -hmm. reusing our own water. Yeah, water conservation, you know. We use the least amount of it allocated to us from all of the states on the Colorado River. Yeah, like desert we, landscape, turf. We've done we've got it down. so much better than every other state that draws from the Colorado River. So again, ignorantly enough, I just think we're too big to fail. Like there's no way that someone's going to let us run out of water. Mm. It just goes back to what you said in the beginning about the, the clickbait headlines. Yeah. Like that's not it. That's nobody wants to read that headline. Everybody yeah. wants to read. Oh my God, Lake Mead has no more water. 
let's click on that one. What? Yeah. What? Let me click that. So yeah. at the end of the day, it is what it is. I like yeah. what you said. Vegas is too big to fail. Yeah. Lake Powell, I think it was today or yesterday, but they just opened up their like floodwater gates and gave us a whole bunch of water because again, we're a little more important than Lake Powell. <laughs> shout, <laughs> so, out, shout out Lake Powell. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. <laughs> Kevin, you're a fascinating guy. Is, is that your selling point? I used to count cards in blackjack. Trust me, I'm a I'm your I don't real estate normally, professional. Yeah, now. I don't mix the two together. They certainly just come up randomly. My boss always jokes around. He always mentions that I'm the worst like salesperson for myself because I've done a bunch of other things but never remember to talk about them. Like in even these situations, like I I have that one story, so I tell the, the card <laughs> counting story and just like know. hey, I can give you the numbers and I'm good with numbers, so good that I'm banned from this yeah. place because of that. <laughs> yeah. If you want someone who's <laughs> thorough with the analytics, I'm your guy. Yeah. Kevin, this has been really, really fun. I'm really glad that we got to get together and chat and love to do this again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Episode eight. I appreciate can. it, man. I I, I, uh, I love the invitation. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this. And yeah, if we want to pick up round two sometime later on, we'll, uh, we'll dive back in. Love to. And lastly, you guys have a podcast too. Yeah. So at Movement Mortgage, I work with uh, my branch manager, Kobe Sherlock. He has a podcast called Living Large Las Vegas. You can find it on YouTube. Similar to this in the sense that, you know, we're not here to talk business all the time. We just want to find personalities in Las Vegas, hear their story, hear where they came from, where they're going, what they do in the community. So if anyone's listening here and wants to see some other stuff about, you know, kind of local Las Vegas people, check out Living Large Las Vegas on YouTube. Awesome. Kevin, thanks for being here. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right.